Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his essay, Concrete Approaches to Investigating the Ontological Mystery, Gabriel Marcel provides us with a number of examples of what he terms mysteries. And he wants to distinguish these sorts of mysteries from anything that somebody thinking about theological mysteries of say the incarnation, you know, in Christianity would, would have, but also from another sense of mystery where it's just some, some problem to be solved. As a matter of fact, he stresses that a mystery is something fundamentally different from a problem, and there are a number of different ways in which they, they vary. A mystery is something deeper than a problem. It involves us with something more, something meta-problematical, in, in meaning something that not only reflects upon the problem, but goes beyond it, that transcends it in some way. It also involves us as being part of the problem in some way. So we can't get out of it, we can't extricate ourselves from it. And the orientation that we take may in fact have very important implications for how well we're able to grasp the mystery at all or uh, as such. So he talks about the ontological mystery. That's in the title of this very piece. And he never comes right out and says, here's my definition of the ontological mystery because mysteries aren't the sort of thing that you can define in any case. But this one is in a certain respect the, you could say, if a mystery is a meta problem, this is the meta mystery. This is the mystery that in a certain sense encompasses and involves all the other ones. And it has to do not with whether there is being, but what being is. We have, as Marcel says, an ontological need or exigency. We have a need for being. We have a need for something that goes beyond what we can categorize, what we can tally up, what we can put together in a system, what we might be able to put into an algorithm or some computer platform or program. We have a need for something more. And there is something more. Now, that mystery we're not going to delve into too much as an example. Let's look instead at some of the other things that he calls mysteries because those reflect on the mystery of being and perhaps help us to understand it. They certainly are brought up in that way in this, this essay. Uh, so one that he talks about early on is the mystery of knowledge. He tells us that it's a mistake to take epistemology as first philosophy because knowledge itself is within being. So it's not as if knowledge yields us what could be being, which is a very common tendency in modern philosophy and even in some, some earlier philosophy as well, but particularly in modern philosophy. And we can substitute for that language if we want it as well. Knowledge is something that we have a hard time formulating knowledge about in a way that actually makes sense. We're able to come up with all sorts of cool theories of what knowledge is, but most of them aren't able to satisfactorily address themselves, let alone the beings that are supposed to be using those theories to make sense out of anything. And Marcel says, really, knowledge is itself a mystery, 
And it's something that requires us to engage in. He uses this term participation. He says, knowledge derives from a mode of participation, a participation in being that no theory of knowledge can account for because the theory itself presupposes this participation. That doesn't mean that we can't learn anything about it or grasp anything about it or penetrate into knowledge or acquire knowledge about knowledge but we do so with it as a mystery, not a problem or a set of problems. He then talks about another very important thing that comes up not only in modern philosophy, but also in ancient and medieval philosophy. How are these things, if they're in things indeed, body and soul, mind, spirit, whatever you want to call it, how are they actually a union? Because that's what I do experience. I don't experience myself as merely wetware, you know, brain connections or anything like that in circulatory systems. I experience myself in my body as my body, but as more than my body. So he says, there is a mystery of the union of one's body and mind, the indivisible unity that is never quite adequately expressed by phrases such as, I have a body, I use my body, I feel my body. It's exterior to any kind of analysis and can in no way, he says, be reconstituted by any synthesis that begins with logically prior elements. The indivisible unity of body and soul is not only given, it's something that we have, right? It's given, we experience it. He says, I will even say it is giving in the sense of what I will call the presence of me to myself, a presence that is only inadequately symbolized by the act of self-consciousness. The union of the body and soul provides us with another example of a mystery, a mystery that bears upon the very nature of our humanity. And indeed, what else might be related to us, but not quite the same as us? For example, an AI. He goes on then to talk about the mystery of evil. And he says it's a mistake to view it as the problem of evil, as so many people in philosophy have done. And so, you know, if we want to say, well, what is this problem? Why is there evil in a world? Why, why do we have to experience the suffering that we do? Why are things as screwed up as they are? He says, um, I am inevitably inclined to treat the problem of evil as a disorder I contemplate whose causes, reasons for being, or hidden purpose I attempt to sort out. How is it that this machine, whether it be the, this machine here of the body or the mechanism of the entire world system, how does it function in a defective manner? Or is it perhaps the apparent flaws due this time to a real defect in my perception? The real disorder is in me, but it remains objective for my thought that discovers and studies it. And then he says, here's the key point. Evil that's only stated or observed is no longer the evil that is suffered. It, it really ceases to be evil. We're no longer grasping what it was that we were attempting to make sense out of. A mystery encompasses the thing that it's attempting to make sense out of. And Marcel says that the key to understanding this is the fact that I am involved. I can't step back and say, why did God create such a world? Was he not powerful enough? Or, you know, take out God and say, why can't humanity make it into this into a paradise? Right? I have to deal with the fact that in asking these questions, I've already contributed in some respect. I have been involved in the breakdowns and the things going wrong and badness within the world. He says, um, I only perceive evil to the extent that it touches me, that is to say, to the extent in which I am involved in the sense of being implicated in the affair. He says, the distinction between what is within me and what would be merely in front of me breaks down under the power of a second order reflection. And another mystery that he talks about at that point, just very briefly, is that of love. Later on, he will talk about love in terms of charity, caritas, right? But he's, he's not really using that term too much there. Instead, he talks about a key Marcellian concept, that of availability. Being there for another, disponibilité in French. Being at the disposal of another who needs us. That is part of what it means to love. 
that cannot be understood in terms of some set of rules, although that doesn't mean that there aren't rules, just that the rules don't encompass it all. And it's something that we have to live out and explore and is never exhausted in, in so far as we're actually living it out. Even after people die, we can continue to love them. And that's kind of a mystery itself, as we're going to talk about. He goes on and he talks about another thing that is really quite interesting, which we could call the mystery of encounter. So he says, here's a particular example. You may have an encounter that is deep and lasting, albeit indeterminate effect on your life. Everyone can have had the experience of what such an encounter can mean from the spiritual point of view, but philosophers t typically ignore this or disdain this. Why? Because it affects only the individual as a person. It's not universalizable. It does not concern thinking beings in general. And yet this is absolutely central for our lives as human persons. This is something that literature and even history will, will engage with. Drama does this as well. So do the fine arts. So he says, it's evident that such encounters present, if you will, a problem. But the solution to the problem falls short of the only question that matters. If someone says to me, you met that person at a certain place because he or she likes the same kind of countryside as you, or his health requires that he or she receive the same treatments, one sees right away the explanation is not there. That's not where you should be looking. How did that person come to matter to me? How did I wind up being engaged with that person? And he says... I find myself in the presence of a mystery, a mist that is to say a reality whose roots go far beyond what is properly speaking the problematical. Will we avoid the difficulty by saying there's nothing here except a question of fortunate coincidence or good luck? I know from within myself there's a strong protest against this hollow phase, this ineffectual negation of something I sense at the very center of myself. He says, I, who inquire about the meaning and conditions of possibility of this encounter, cannot place myself outside or opposite. I am engaged in this encounter. I depend on it. I am in some way interior to it. It envelops and comprehends me, even if I don't comprehend it. It has changed me. But the change hasn't been some mere exterior force impinging upon me. It has called out of myself things by which I have changed myself. Now think about every important relationship that you have had, whether with a mentor or, or somebody who you learned from, whether it was a friend, whether it was a rival who somehow brought out something important from you, whether it was an author who somehow you encountered and engaged through their texts. There's a mystery there something that Marcel says goes beyond the realm of the problematic. He also talks about, a little bit later, death. What do we make of death? He tells us that um, those who you know, we, we love, um, after they, they have died, do they exist in any way whatsoever? Um, he tells us, well... That's actually a mystery. Do they have any presence? Do they live on in our memories? What does that mean to live on in, in a memory? Are the living and the dead in any way connected with each other? This is a fundamental existential question. If we conceive of death merely in the sense of a function and a ceasing of a function, really, then there's, there's no question at all. No, of course not. There's no, it's all in your head. But perhaps that's not all that's going on. Another thing that he talks about is the mystery of hope. And Marcel spends a lot of time uh, unpacking what genuine hope would look like as opposed to mere Pollyannish, you know, looking on the bright side of life or anything along those lines. And, you know, he tells us that genuine hope... Um, Hope in the heart of the one it inhabits and the judgments cast upon it by someone who remains a prisoner of objectivity. Um, genuine hope can't be understood by some sort of person like that because it, it straddles the border between pure problems and pure 
mystery. Um, he tells us that what hope is, is, he says, to hope against all hope that the person who I love will recover from an illness that is devouring her and which is considered to be incurable is to say, it is not possible that I am alone in willing her recovery. It is impossible that reality at its very depths is hostile or only indifferent to what I declare to be a good in itself. A little later, he gives you another really wonderful characterization of, of hope as thinking that there is something there that will cooperate with you in being if it is what is ought to be. Now, you can frame that in terms of a problem, but what we're talking about there really involves the very core of a human being. This is a mystery. It's affirming something meta-problematical, something going beyond the realm of, of the problems and the techniques that can be used to resolve them. One last one that he mentions in there as well is the meaning of the value or the mystery of the value of life. And here we have, you know, the typical philosophical question, right? Everybody shows up to philosophy 101 or they hear that you're a philosophy professor and they say, oh, hey, what's the meaning of life, right? As if that's something that you could just say, well, it's 42 or it's uh, uh, have a lot of fun or, you know, serve God or pick something like that. Something that you could encapsulate in a nice slogan. If life was just a problem, yes, you could do that. Or perhaps it might be more complicated and you need a whole manual with lots and lots of cases. But it could be then just turned into a set of, you know, procedures to follow. That's not the way life actually works. The question of the value or the meaning of life in general and one's own life is a Marcellian mystery. It is something that involves us, the very stance that we take, the very choices that we make, the experiences that we undergo, the interpretation of that experience on our part will, will inevitably color the question itself in such a way that might keep some of us from ever getting an answer, but might open up the possibility for greater answers to, to many of us. And we might not even like the answer. We might have to struggle with the mystery that the answer seems to be imposing upon us. So hopefully by looking at each of these, we see that they have these, these traits in common of being meta-problematical, of involving us as subjects, of in, you know, connecting us to something that goes beyond us and the realm of our knowledge or our problem, problematization of these matters and ultimately connects us with the mystery of being something that Marcel thinks that we have, whether we realize it or not, a fundamental need or exigency or demand for at the center of our own being. These mysteries are ways in which we live out these particular modes, you might say, of the fundamental problem, but each of them matters in its own right as well. And they all, to some degree, connect up with each other if we look at them closely and long, and you might say, generously enough. <laughs>